All right, here we go. We're going to go over the question number six from the 2008 AP Calculus AB exam. This is a non calculator question. Solid little question. All right, let's get after it. It says the slope field for the given differential equation. So they gave us this differential equation is shown below. And it says sketch the solution curve that passes through the point zero two. And then it says sketch the solution curve that passes through the point the one is zero. All right, so how do we do it? Well, we go to the point zero two, which they were kind enough to put a dot for us. And then you just kind of follow the slopes. Think of it as like a stream and just follow the direction of the stream. So if you see here at zero two, all of these slopes are horizontal. There's no curve at all to them. So that's going to lead us to believe that when we sketch this solution curve, it's really just going to be a horizontal line. So this would be a particular solution to this differential equation that satisfies the point zero, two, all right? Now, if we look at the next one, all right, we want to go through the point one, zero. So if we plot that, it looks like that. This is a little bit more interesting, right? So we have to kind of sketch this. So if you look at the slopes here, it looks like they're kind of going up. They're positive, but they're leveling off, almost like right here, you have some sort of horizontal asymptote. All right. So when I'm sketching this, I'm kind of going up like that and I'm showing that it's leveling off. Right. I'm not going to go in a direct path to intersect this. Um, it looks like this guy is symmetric. Right. These slopes are symmetric here and it looks like they're dipping down, coming back up and then doing the same thing on the other side, doing my best to make that symmetric. And that would be the solution curve that goes through the point one zero. So if we were to solve this differential equation, uh, and plug in the point one zero and zero two. Uh, these are what we would get. Okay. All right. So pretty basic there. There was there was nothing fancy. Sometimes though they do test you on uh, the following. So this is has nothing to do with this question, but I do want to pop this up. This is a completely different question. So we can call this notes, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and this is a slope field for the differential equation dy dx equals negative x over y, right? And if you look at it, it looks like we're getting the, these a bunch of circles, right? So if I asked a very similar question, which is plot the solution curve that goes through the point zero two, zero two is like right here, right? You might be tempted to draw a circle, okay? because that's kind of how it would flow, but that would be incorrect, all right? So what we do with this, and this is the basic concept, right, is we do follow the slopes, but you are not allowed to cross a spot where the slopes are not defined, okay? Think of that as, all right, let me do that again, because that's not even coming close to two. I can do a better job at a circle, all right? So, <clears throat> Give that a go again. So this is negative two, that's two, and then that's two. Okay, so when I go to sketch this, all right, I have to stop here because there are no slopes there. Now, you know, you might be thinking, well, how do you know there are no slopes there? Maybe the slopes are horizontal uh, and it's blending with the x axis, which believe it or not happens a lot, but you know it because you're smart because I told you this is the differential equation. And what do we know about? what happens when y is equal to zero, which would be every point on the x-axis, right? When y is equal to zero, all right, there'd be no slope, it's not defined, okay? There'd be like a vertical slope, but the slope itself is not defined. So that's, you'd have to stop there, all right? So that's not the best job of me sketching that, but you get the idea, all right? If I wanted to go through the point, say negative four, zero, right? So maybe this was the one I had to go through, all right, it'd be the same type of thing. It's just going to be the bottom half of that circular relation where we don't want to cross any spot where the slope is not defined. And I'm not going to get too much in the particulars of that. Uh, just know that, okay? So again, those, that was just a side note uh, in regards to this question. This, obviously, this has nothing to do with this, this question. All right, let's go to the next question here. All right, next part. It says, let y equal f of x be a particular solution to the given differential equation with the initial condition f of 1 equals 0. All right, so that's just the point there. So f of 1 equals 0, that means the point x, y is going to be on the graph here. That's a blender in the background, in case you were wondering. Uh, it says, write an equation for the line tangent to the graph of y equals f of x at x equals 1. So as soon as you see equation for the line tangent, right, you guys should be thinking point slope formula. Y minus Y1 equals M times X minus X1, right? 
That's how you write the equation of any line. Now, what do you need to have in order to use this? It's called the point slope formula. Take a wild guess. You need a point and a slope. So what is the point? Well, they told you the point was one zero. So that's flat out given to you. What is the slope? All right. It's kind of incorrect to say that this is the slope because this is really the slope machine or the slope producing formula. I need the slope specifically at one zero. So I need a dy dx specifically at the point one comma zero. So I'm going to chuck one in for x, zero in for y into this guy here. So I get one third times one and then zero minus two squared. So that's negative two squared. So that's going to be four times a third is four thirds. So my slope is four thirds. My point is one zero. So these are my ingredients. This is the recipe. Let's bake the cake. All right. So here we go. So you're going to get y minus zero equals four thirds times x minus one. Call it a day. All right. That is the equation of your tangent line. Okay. No need to spruce a deuce, although let's be honest, this is kind of obvious. Y minus zero, that's just y. But this is it. This is the equation of your tangent line. All right. Call it a day. Put a happy cloud around it. Okay. So now, what was the second part of this question? Okay, the second part said, use your equation to approximate f of 0.7. So the key being here, using the tangent line to approximate. So that is that whole topic or concept of linearizations or local linear approximations. So to write a local linear approximation, it's, it's really a joke. You get the equation of the tangent line, which we did, and then you basically just solve for y. So that's going to be kind of a joke here because y minus zero, that's just y. So you get y equals four thirds times x minus one. So that's it. So now for good measure, though, we usually will replace the y with some function notation and we'll call it L of x for linearization is four thirds x minus one. All right, let's just take a second and stop and understand what it is you're finding. So you have a curve f and I don't know what it looks like, but I'm going to make it curvy. So there is f. You come along and you write the equation of a tangent line at a particular value. In this case, we wrote the equation of the tangent line at the point one zero. All right. So that is L. That's what L is. Right. So this thing here is just an equation of a line. All right. And then F is the curve. And so what we're doing is we're using the blue line to approximate the black curve, which at first glance seems ludicrous. Right. But then you get the concept of local linearity, which means basically if you zoom in close enough or if you get close enough to the point one zero, then you know what? There actually won't be much difference between the line and the curve as long as I'm close to the point of tangency. So the idea is that L of X is going to be used to approximate F of X. This is basically the key concept. So now we're going to go ahead and use that to approximate f of 0.7. So f of 0.7 is approximately equal to L of 0.7. Okay, so let me do L of 0.7. So that would be 4 thirds times 0.7 minus 1. 0.7 minus 1 is going to be negative 0.3. So I get 4 thirds times negative 0.3. And you were expected to do this without a calculator. So all right, let's think about you know, our elementary math skills here, right? Negative times a positive is a, is a negative. So that's going to be four thirds times. And then, you know, 0.3. How do I want to look at this? I don't know. Maybe I want to look at this as three over 10. All right. So I'm going to multiply them right there. And then I can see that the threes are just going to cancel. And then I'm going to get a final answer of negative four over 10, which if I'm going with the whole decimal theme, that's negative 0.4, right? Move the decimal one place to the left. And that's it. So that's an approximate value for the functional value when the input is 0.7. And we're using the equation of the tangent line to figure that out. All right. So that's bread and butter linearization question right there. Solid stuff. All right. You should be able to wreck that question. And by wreck, I mean get it correct. All right. So let's go to the next part of this, the last part, awesome part. So now it says find the particular solution. All right, to the given differential equation with the same initial condition. So we still got that initial condition of one zero. Okay. So a particular solution means you're solving for C. If they said general solution, then you'd have a C in your answer, right? A family of functions differing by a constant that satisfy the differential equation. Particular solution means that not only are we going to find a function y equals f of x, 
uh, that satisfies a differential equation, but it also is going to go through that point. Okay. Um, all right, so let's go get them. So how do you solve differential equations in this class? Well, there's only one way uh, that you need to know uh, how to do it, and that's uh, separation of variables. So basically get your y's on one side, your x is on the other, right? And what dictates that is your derivative. And since dy over here is up top in the numerator, that means all your y's are going to come to the left side. You see this expression here has y in it. So to get rid of it from this side, I'm just going to divide both sides of this equal sign by that chunk of stuff. So I'm gonna get dy over y minus two quantity squared, right? And at the same time now, my dx is in a denominator, that's no bueno. We need our dy's and our dx's to be up top, all right? And so I would multiply both sides of this equation by dx and cancel here, and over here I get one third x dx, okay? And now both sides are in a Riemann integrable form. And not that I have to go a step further, but I will here. Um, let me rewrite this as y minus 2 to the negative 2 times dy. And I'm going to get over here, um, sticking with my theme of red and blue, I'm just going to get the same thing. Okay, And the reason why I wanted to do this for video flavor is because both sides now are in a Riemann integral form. So in other words, you have function times dy and function times dx. So it's not enough just to separate the variables, but you need both sides to be basically in the form of a product of something times d whatever, in this case dy and dx. Otherwise, it would not be Riemann integrable. This is, we're good, we got the green light, that means you integrate both sides, okay? All right, so now how would I integrate the left side? Uh, you may have looked up here and been like, oh, isn't that ln? It's not ln because it's not you know, one over stuff. There's like stuff squared here, right? So this is not linear down here. So this would not be ln. If you're not following that, that's fine. So then how would I integrate this? Well, the long way to integrate this would be like, hey, you know, it's a composition. You know, one of the skills I learned uh, for integration techniques is a U substitution. So maybe to the side here, let's do it. So if I let U equal Y minus 2, then du would be 1, the derivative of that, times dy, okay? And so now if I look at this, right, I have the integral of y minus 2 to the negative 2 dy. So think about this now. You're saying 1 dy is du. So this becomes du. This is just u to the negative 2. So when I rewrite this, I get the integral of u to the negative 2 du, which is like, okay, now I can use the power rule for integration. So power rule says add 1 to the power, right? So add 1 to that, you get negative 1, and then multiply by 1 over that power or divide by that power, however you want to think about it. And then, of course, it's an indefinite integral, so then add your constant, right? So now I would get negative u, but I picked u. I know u is y minus 2, so I'm going to get negative y minus 2 to the negative 1 plus c. And that's it. And that would be the integral right over here. And I can kind of just do this to the side and come over here and plug it in. Now, that took time to do that u sub. And if you remember, when your u is, what do you think I'm going to say here? When your u is what, you can kind of do it a shortcut way or, or in your head or maybe even think of it as a reverse chain rule, even though that thing, the reverse chain rule, does, there's no such thing, all right? But there kind of is when your u is linear, all right? When your u is linear, you can do these in your head. So you can view this as stuff to the negative 2. And so now how do I integrate stuff to the negative 2? It's going to be stuff to the negative 1 times 1 over negative 1. But then here's the kicker that didn't really show up here. I have to multiply by 1 over the derivative of stuff. Now, stuff is y minus 2, and the derivative of that is 1, right? Derivative of 1 y minus 2 is 1. So I need that. Now, in this particular problem, I don't need it. If you forgot it, you'd be totally fine. But if that would have been 5y minus 2, I'd have to multiply by 1 fifth. And you can see how that would play out here. If this would have been 5y minus 2, I would have got 5 dy, which that's not what this is. So then I would have got 1 fifth du equals dy, right? And then that 1 fifth would have came out, and that's where it would have been, uh, came from. All right, so it's kind of a crappy example that I have to do because this is just y minus 2, but it actually helps you out at the end of the day. So that's it. And so that's really how quickly it should have been done. There's really no need to do this, but if you're not good with this, then that's what you do, okay? All right, so then rock it and roll. Let's integrate this side much easier. You're going to get a constant times the integral of x. That's going to be 1 half x squared. 
And if I stopped here, if I left it here, I've told you this a bazillion times before, you would get hammered, right, in the grading. Why is that? Because we forgot what? We forgot our constant of integration, right? When you do an indefinite integral, you got to add that constant. So technically, I should be adding plus C on this side, plus C on this side, right? But at the end of the day, I want to solve for Y. You know, how do you know you want to solve for Y? Well, it says it right here. Find the particular solution Y equals. So this is telling you, hey, Momo, solve for Y. So at the end of the day, I want to solve for Y. So why would I add a C over here just so I have to subtract it later on? And a constant minus a constant, just a constant right? So you can get away with just adding a constant to one side. And obviously, I would pick the side that is away from what you're solving for. All right, so let's spruce this up, right? Well, calculus, by the way, is over now. The rest of this is all algebra and pre-calc stuff. All right, so if I spruce this up, I'm going to get negative y minus 2 raised to the negative 1 equals 1 sixth x squared plus c. So that would be like my implicit general solution that satisfies this differential equation, okay? But I got to find C now because it said find the particular solution. And all that means to me when they say that is you're going to have to solve for C. And in order for you to do that, they're going to have to give you a condition. And they did, right? So I'm going to find it right now. So I'm going to plug zero in for Y. So negative zero minus two to the negative one equals one six plug one in for X. All right, and so now we got to bust out our arithmetic skills here. So now this would be minus negative 2 to the negative 1. There's a lot of minus signs there. And then this would just be 1, 6 plus C. So what the heck is negative 2 minus 1, All right? Maybe I'll do this to the side over here. So negative 2 minus 1, right? Definition of negative exponents, that's just 1 over negative 2 to the positive 1, which is just 1 over negative 2, which is just negative 1 half. So this is negative a half. So you have negative a half times negative one. So that's positive a half, guys. And yes, you would have to do that without a calculator when you took this exam, but you technically, you can have a calculator. So that you won't have to worry about that. And so now I want to solve for C. I would rather think, obviously, of a half as uh, three-sixths, right? So I can multiply this guy. I don't know why I'm showing this, but I will, by three over three. So three-sixths minus one-sixth is two-sixths. So there's your C there. So one third equals C. All right. So now I can put this all together back in. I'll go to this line here. All right. Draw a little squiggle wiggle. All right. And so now I have negative Y minus two to the negative one is going to equal one sixth X squared and then plus one third. Okay. And so now we have to go ahead and solve for Y. So your, your approach and how you solve for Y is going to decide on whether or not this is going to be messy or sloppy for you, okay? Um, so I'm going to try and do it in a way that I think you may do it. Uh, I'm not 100% sure if you would do it this way. There's definitely you know, a more efficient, less sloppy way to go about it, but this is how I'm going to go about it, all right? So I'm solving for Y. So maybe the first thing I would be like is, hey, man, I want to get rid of this negative, okay? So I'm going to go ahead... <clears throat> And I'm going to multiply both sides by a negative, and I got to multiply the whole side. So I get that. All right. So you're like, all right, cool. So now what do I got going on? Well, we have to understand what this means, right? So I'll take a second for video flavor just to rewrite that this means that. Okay. So now I want to solve for y here. So my y is in the denominator. So what the heck do I do? Well, a valid move in solving equations is to flip both sides. So I can flip this side and just get y minus 2. Now, when you f I said flip both sides, right? Not flip parts individually. So when you flip this, you have to flip the entire thing. So it actually probably would have benefited me to multiply this by 2 over 2 and express this as a single fraction and then just flip that single fraction. Uh, but I don't know if you would have thought to do that, all right? So I'm gonna go about it as if you did. If you did, God bless you, all right? If you didn't, here we go. So I'm gonna flip this whole thing now. So I'm gonna get one over negative one sixth x squared minus a third, all right? So that's pretty nasty looking, okay? And now if I solve for y, it would basically just be add 2 to both sides. So I get 1 over negative 1 sixth x squared minus a third plus 2. And quite honestly, 
I mean, there's really no need to be a hero. Leave it. That is 100% correct. But, you know, in, in I don't want to say in real life, but in, in math life, we, you know, we never leave this. This is like sloppy. This is like forbidden. You know, like a, you have a fraction within a fraction. Oh, my God. It's the end of the world, right? So we can clean this up. And there's a couple of ways to clean this up. Um, I'm going to do the following. First off, I noticed that there's negative, negative in the bottom. I'm just going to pull that negative out, right? So the first thing I can do is I can say negative, kind of put it to the side of the fraction, and then get one-sixth X squared plus one-third, all right? Whoop, like that. So that's a nice little sprucey doocy. Uh, get rid of the two negatives, okay? So you can put the negative one in the numerator too if you want, but I just kind of put it to the side. So that's equivalent. So then you're like, well, how do I get rid of these fractions? It's actually not too complicated, and this is a good skill for you to have, right? What's annoying about this? These things are annoying. So is there some sort of multiple that I can multiply the bottom by that's going to wipe both of these out? And hopefully you can say or see that, yeah, that answer would be six, right? So I can go ahead and multiply the bottom by six, and I can multiply the top by six. All right, I'm allowed to do that because I'm basically just multiplying the fraction by one over one, all right, which is multiplying it by one, which doesn't do anything to it, right? So now if I clean this up, I'm going to get, uh, let's see here, negative six over distribute here. I'm going to get, let's see, x squared plus two and then plus two, all right? And that ends up being my answer. If you look at the answer key, they have it as two minus six over x squared plus two. Obviously, that's the same thing. Okay. So that's your answer. But, you know, quite honestly, you know, they tell you don't reduce if you, unless otherwise stated. So this is, this is fine to have that. All right. If you would have did what I set up here and maybe got like a common denominator, added your fraction, and then just flipped the fraction, you get to this, I think, a little bit more efficiently. All right. Although that's arguable too. All right, but that's your answer. So this is not only going to satisfy the differential equation, but it will also satisfy that initial point. Which, by the way, this is a cool question because the initial point was one zero. So if I go back here, right, you basically just found the equation of that blue curve that you sketched initially, which is, if you ask me, kind of super cool. Okay. All right. So that's question six. Uh, we only got a week left, guys, to study for this AP test, this new two-question AP test. Uh, some of you guys slacked off a little bit uh, in terms of handing your assignments, so please get back on track. Let's have a good, solid last push, a good, solid last week before you take this test. Take care. Stay safe.